Welcome to today's webinar. I'm Jan Ground. I am the Colorado Liaison to the Southwest Telehealth Resource Center. And I'd like to uh, extend a special welcome to those who live in the Southwest regions. Since 2011, the Southwest Telehealth Resource Center has partnered with the Arizona Telemedicine Program to bring you over 160 informative webinars. Today's webinar and all of our webinars are recorded have been, and have been archived and are available on demand. So as you join the webinar today, you won't be surprised that your microphone has been muted. And please use the chat function of the Zoom to ask questions. We'll answer questions at the end of the presentation. Today's webinar is being recorded and you will be able to access today's webinar and previous webinars on our website. The URL is listed on this slide and we will also post the URL in the chat. So let's get started. First of all, my name is Jan Ground and I started my career as a pediatric physical therapist and spent my last lots of years of my career, my full-time career with Kaiser Permanente in Colorado. Um, it is my pleasure to, to introduce today's webinar, Care by Video, Telephone, Email, Chat, Text, Remote Monitoring, Venture Offer Which if Reimbursement is Not an Issue. Let's see, I spent the last 10 years of my career leading innovation for Kaiser Permanente of Colorado and finally specifically virtual care. I am honored, very honored, to introduce you to four physicians with whom I worked closely at Kaiser Permanente. All of them were at Kaiser Permanente Colorado when we went from 100% face-to-face care to scheduled phone visits and then it added email. And I will add, we had scheduled phone visits and email before I joined Kaiser Permanente in 1999. That's how long ago it was. Then we added care by video and then specifically chat. Today we have, and why don't you wave when I say your name, Adam Carew is a family physician and medical informaticist. He's currently the director of the medical informatics of the Colorado Permanente Medical Group. He focuses on optimization and digital, optimizing the tools and the people and the care teams that are delivering healthcare for the Colorado Permanente Medical Group. Next we have, and please wave, Jen Zuris is an internal medicine physician, currently the medical director for OptumCare Colorado, working with independent practices focused on how to provide value-based care. Next we have Eric Harker, an internal medicine physician. He was 17 years with Kaiser Permanente Colorado. He is now the practice medical director at Iora. Iora is a Medicare value-based provider, historically focused on Medicare Advantage patients, taking on full risk of care. They're moving to original Medicare as well through a pilot that maintains value-based care. And finally, but certainly not least, Ed Bleen is also an internal medicine physician. He is a physician reviewer for the, for the Department of Member Relations of the Colorado Permanente Medical Group and a senior investigator for KPCO's Institute for Healthcare Research. I'm gonna show you a couple of slides just to kind of set the tone and make sure we're all defining things the same. The main thing I wanna tell you with this slide is to us, at least the five people on the screen, telehealth does not equal video visits. Um, so telehealth, how I would define it is care provided with a patient that's not physically co-located with a clinician. And in fact, you don't even need to have a clinician using artificial intelligence. But if there is a clinician, the patient is not physically co-located with, with him or her. And that includes all these things, of which these physicians have experience with all these things, text and chat and email and telephone and video and remote monitoring. We're gonna talk about all of those today. On the right side are more self-care options. They're also part of virtual care, but we won't talk about them today. One more thing I wanna say about telehealth that divides those ideas even further is, a video visit could be provided by your own doctor or your own therapist or your own nurse, or it could be provided by a doctor or a therapist or a nurse. It could be scheduled, just like a face-to-face -face visit is scheduled, or it could be on demand. I want the care now, please care for me now. 
It could be synchronous, meaning the clinician and the patient are going back and forth at the same time, or it could be asynchronous where uh, the patient may choose to text or email or chat, um, not so much chat, and the doctor will get back to the patient when he or she has time. My last slide before I hand it over to the doctors is, we added, when do you choose which of these if reimbursement is not an issue? And reimbursement is, is not an issue or it has not been an issue for these docs for most of their medical careers because they've worked in the world of value-based care, value-based payment. And this is where doctors, hospitals, therapists, nurses are paid based on outcomes, not on the number of procedures under a patient scene. So you may or may not have experience with doing that, I think we all know that the country may be moving in that direction, and we hope that that's why you joined us today to learn more about how do you do this if things change toward value-based care. So I'm going to now stop sharing and ask the questions. So I'm going to start off, well, I lost my piece of paper, hold on. I'm going to start off by asking Jen Zeros to start to talk about your experience over time with virtual care options since the beginning of your practice till now. You have about four minutes. Thank you, Jan. So hello, everybody. We're excited to be here with you. Um, and I'm excited to be with a lot of my old partners because we worked wonderfully well together over the years. Um, and my journey started actually when I first joined Kaiser. So I came to Kaiser about 15 years ago where I had just left a private solo practice where I did traditional internal medicine, both hospital-based and non-hospital-based. And as I started, I remember one of the first things that I had to do was triage a patient with back pain um, over the phone. And I remember talking to my chief at the time being like, wait a minute, I'm not going to bring them in. It's, it's back pain. What if it's cauto What if it's this more serious condition? And it was, for me, the first thing that came up was this fear of, am I going to be able to really care for this patient? And some of the things that I've learned over the years is that if I think about it, right, 80% of what we do, it, history based. We know that we don't always have to listen to a patient or hear their lungs or move their joints. It's really just, what are you telling me? And I'm able to create my differential from that. And even like with this back pain, it was like, again, what is, if you're going to have a cotoquiner, if there's a red flag, well, great, then you have identified it and now you're gonna bring them in or you're gonna send them where they need to go but we know that those are pretty rare. Um, and what I found over the years, the benefit of having specifically, I would say scheduled phone visits versus just a patient calls and now you're playing phone tag, is that increases the communication with the patient. So I'm able to get to my patients more quickly. Um, and that has then increased my access. So now I have time to see those acute needs where I need to get that patient in. Um, and it prevents them from having to go to the emergency room or the, emer or the urgent care, et cetera. It's allowed me to provide better care because I think a lot of our patients delay care because they can't get in. Um, and then that's that, that more timely care. Um, from the phone visits, we then move towards email. And with emails, I also found those to be predominantly pretty helpful. So this was a very quick, easy way for patients to engage with us and ask us questions, especially ones that we could manage remotely. Um, if, for example, when was my last refill? Do I still need this med? Hey doc, I didn't understand your directions. What did you want me to do? Am I cutting it in half or adding? And they didn't have to be a slave to when was our appointment times or our office hours or when a nurse was gonna answer the phone. They could email Saturday at 10 o'clock at night. And it was always that conversation with them of, hey, you know, we're only working Monday through Friday. It's gonna take me some time and really educating them. Don't email me chest pain emails, my lowest risk, my lowest, the last thing I do, I do everything else first. But once the patients understood that it was this kind of low risk, wait for the communication, it really proved to be a wonderful tool. And eventually we were able to evolve to where our staff helped triage some of those. So if it's a pharmacy question, it could go to a pharmacist. If it was a refill, when was my last physical, the MA or LPN could answer it. So it really helped move stuff off the provider plate and really focus on the right person doing the right level of care. Um, I think one thing that I did also learn from just the video, from the emails itself is um, if you do go down that path or you're already there, it can lead to a lot of back and forth. And that I found pretty frustrating because it wasn't getting to that resolution. And so general rule of thumb for myself was if it, if it required more than two times back and forth, phone visit. And I just said, hey, call us up. Let's just get a phone visit so we can resolve this pretty quickly. And that worked, that worked well for me. 
Um, my first, and then my first real deep dive into video. So Kaiser had done video, but I was also worked with Eric at Iora for for a year or so. And with that, we we had implemented a pretty robust video. And I would say that was extremely helpful in establishing care and trust with patients. Um, and was perfect in a time of COVID and a pandemic where patients can't always get in. And especially as an internist taking care of a lot of elderly patients, we always see that happen where patients can't get in because their families can't drive them, et cetera. And I think video provides such a wonderful way to connect with people visually, see their facial expressions, et cetera. That's been, that was really wonderful. Um, and then chat, and I apologize, Jan, because I'm running over, I'm at my timer. Chat, I would say I never was a provider of chat, but I've certainly utilized chat. And so I have four children and I have leveraged chat within Kaiser for a number of years. And it's such a phenomenal function to get quick resolution on my time. So I can do it in between a meeting, I can do it in between whatever, and I get the level of care that I need pretty quickly. And so huge proponent of chat. Thank you, Jan. Thank you, Jan. Dr. Dr. Zeres, thank you. Adam, your comments. I guess I should be saying Dr. Carew, shouldn't I? Call me Adam. We're on a personal basis. Um, no, thanks, Jen. That was a um, <clears throat> like a really good summary, not only of your experience, but but I think kind of framed up a lot of what the discussion will be today. I mean, so personally for me, I um, I, uh, I trained in family medicine right here in Denver, and you know when I was in residency, this was about <clears throat> ten years ago. We didn't have the opportunity really for. Um, really any kind of robust telehealth tools. Frankly, when I started residency, we were still on paper. Um, so with paper, it's obviously challenging. We obviously used phones and that was really the extent of that experience. Um, you know, I think though what happened around that time though was uh, the consumer technology that, you know, eventually became mainstream in healthcare was really starting to flourish. Um, I mean, obviously instant messaging was, was pretty uh, ubiquitous um, and then, you know, video slowly came, you know, came along either right around that time or after and became really commonplace. Um, even, even though some established players like Skype and those things were around for a long time, it, um, it really became mainstream when our uh, digital devices and, you know, iPhones, Android devices really kind of expanded. Um, my, so when I joined, you know, I initially was a clinician um, practicing really full-time as I think technically four days a week um, as a for as a, a primary care um, continuity uh, physician. So, as Jen mentioned, you know, scheduled telephone visits were kind of my first experience with this, and I was like, "Wow, I get a I get time where I can I talk to a patient for ten minutes." And you know, and I think I really want to highlight the point Jen made that you know what's amazing about all these different digital telehealth solutions is, you know, as a clinician, we really do gather the vast majority of what's going on with the patient through that history. So regardless of mode that, you know, Jan laid out nicely in the beginning, you know, all those modes have the ability to, to capture essentially the HPI and the review of systems. And, you know, I think as over time, as these things merge and meld together, we'll really be able to leverage, you know, different tools. And I know we're not gonna specifically target digital tools, but digital tools will be able to augment a lot of this too. So as a clinician, you may be getting, you know, a nice platter served up to you in some sort of telehealth venue where um, it already has all that history. It's like where you worked with a resident and that resident went in and gathered all the detailed history and came to you with, with the summary. Um, so for me personally, that was my experience. I started to transition as I started to do more um, in the informatics space. Um, and it was, and it was challenging to be a, continuity physician and start to really kind of uh, build this the informatics work. So I transitioned to working in urgent care. Again, urgent care at that time, we didn't have um, a lot of telehealth solutions. Um, now we, we are starting to experiment with some of those, like being able to have an ad hoc video conference with a pediatrician that when there's not a pediatrics specific provider in one of our urgent cares um, and things like that. Um, and then as, you know, Jen finished with, um, I was one of the first physicians that started with um, what we call our chat with the doc service in Kaiser, Colorado. And it started with, I think actually when it started, there was only two of us online at one time. Um, it was kind of a stealth release where it was live on our website, but um, it wasn't advertised. It wasn't promoted. Um, I do recall one day that I'll share that was um, eye-opening to me about how important I think this 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 mode particularly was 
Um, Kaiser Permanente operates in many different areas of the country and they operate as separate entities. And this service was only in Colorado. There was an error on the website that published our chat with a doc link to all the Kaiser regions, including California, which if anyone has any knowledge of Kaiser, Kaiser California regions are huge. And so when I logged on that morning, there was over 250 people in the queue. Um, and I quickly um, did not know what was going on, but um, we quickly figured out what had happened and, uh, um, and we had to shut it down. But, um, and, and today, I mean, I think my focus now is to try to, how do we continue to enhance these so clinicians can continue to do the, the provider work as Jen again alluded to, um, and allow us to help make these decisions in these different venues. It's all in there, Jan. Thank you. Thank you, Adam. Yeah. Okay, so now we're gonna to get to more specific and I wanna have two docs focus on specifically email and text and chat. And I've learned recently that text and chat are not the same thing. Um, when you've used when, for what, and especially share with us what's worked well and when have you used them that has, hasn't worked well. In fact, Jen already gave us an example of that. But we're gonna start out with Dr. Eric Harder. Thanks, Jan. Uh, I thought I'd start, start with just uh, making a point. I don't know if you can see this. This is my background. Um, I'm in Hawaii on vacation, um, but I could be working. And my point about that is just that one of the benefits of telehealth is that I think it allows a certain amount of um, freedom of movement for physicians. You know, it's hard being a doctor and uh, tough taking vacations, getting coverage, all this kind of stuff. And I've, I've worked from a cabin in the woods. Uh, you know, I've worked on uh, many different places. So that's, that's a huge benefit to us. Back to your question. Um, I think of a couple of things. One is um, what type of patient are you dealing with? And then the other is what type of communication or interaction are you dealing with? Um, and by patient, I mean, you know, is this an elderly complex patient on 12 medications uh, with, with a lot of medical problems? Um, and it's hard to tell if they're, if they're really sick or not. Um, and for that type of patient, I think um, it's really important to set up your communication options um, focused on continuity. So how do we get this patient to communicate with their primary care um, doctor or team? Because we know them well, we're not going to be scared when we see what they look like or how they sound. Um, so that type of person you want to, you know, focus and, and try to encourage them to use phone, video, um, synchronous communication where you can go back and forth and get a sense of, of what's going on. Um, obviously, the other end of that spectrum is the young, healthy patient that's not complex. Um, they're often looking for um, convenience. I think um, asynchronous communication, you know, makes a lot of sense um, for that type of patient. So one, you know, think about how you stratify your patients and how you want to, um, you know, target your, your communication to them. And then the second thing is what, what type of communication is it? To Jen's point, is this a, a communication that's going to require you know, multiple iterations over a short period of time. Um, I had a guy email me literally from a cliff. He fell, he, he was climbing, he fell onto a ledge, he messed up his leg, he sent me a photo via email. I got it the next day, you know, he was saying, what should I do? I said, you know, climb down and go to the ER. Um, not, a, not a great type of interaction for uh, asynchronous communication. So um, I think of it in terms of, you know, email is probably the most asynchronous, maybe you're going to respond once a day, something along those lines. Um, text, people have a little bit more of an expectation that you're going to get back to them within a few hours with text. Chat, it's going to be, you know, a few minutes between interactions. Um, and then, of course, you know, video and, and phone are going to be uh, synchronous real time. Uh, ask follow-up questions, that kind of thing. Um, so this all goes wrong when you have a mismatch either with the patient or the type of communication. And so to Jen's point, I've seen, um, particularly with my partners, maybe who haven't done as much telemedicine, you know, I'll go in and I'll see a string of text or email that's maybe 20 pages long. And it just keeps going and evolving in this conversation. You know, and at some point you just gotta, you have to stop that line of communication, start a new one to Jen's point, you know, shift it over to synchronous communication. I think you either, you know, have need to have rules uh, protocols for, okay, 2x, back and forth, boom, this goes to a, to a phone appointment or a video appointment, 
um, or you need to have some really good training around how do you facilitate this communication. And maybe it's, it's a matter of both. I've never seen good training of physicians and providers around how to use telehealth in this, in this way. It's usually been sort of, all right, doc, you guys are pretty innovative. Here's this tool, you know, figure out how to use it. And I think that's fine for early adopters, but I think as this gets more broad, I think you really want to have protocols, what type of communication, what type of issues, what type of patients, um, and then really train to that. Um, and then the last thing I would say is just to Jen's point around, you know, how to use telehealth successfully. Um, you know, the physical exam doesn't do a whole lot for, for a lot of conditions in terms of figuring out what's going on, but it does a lot for building trust and, and building those relationships. You know, a hand on the shoulder means a lot. Looking people in the eye, that handshake at the beginning of the end of a visit. Um, so you have to build relationships based on building trust. How do you build trust? Well, you prove that you're available and you're there for them and that you're gonna provide them the care that they want and need when they want it, where they want it. Um, and, and that's what I found is that, hey, we're here for you. you can you can reach us you know, when you want in the way that you want and you can build trust on that. So I'll end with that. Thank you, Dr. Garrick. Um, Adam, it's your turn to comment on the same thing. And I'm just gonna point out that someone asked in, in the chat about use cases, specific use cases. So you dads might wanna talk about specific use cases, but again, we're talking specifically about email, chat, and text. Adam, you got it. Try to unmute myself. Um, yeah, no, I think, I mean, I think Eric laid that out really well. And I, um, I mean, I'd agree with every, every, all his entire perspective. I mean, I think the only probably other thing I would add is, you know, specifically when you're dealing with, you know, a, a really like, kind of like a written typed form of, of communication, um, it's, you know, it, it it is challenging sometimes to get that extra layer of inf information that you need, you know, because uh, the way I always look at it is someone's contacting you, whether it's through kind of a synchronous uh, platform or a uh, truly asynchronous with a true concern they're having. It's a true worry. And, you know, I think sometimes, you know, you know, I think maybe this is one of the differences between um, the way a, like a physician is trained and maybe a nurse is trained for traditional triage, you know, like, you know, I think a lot of times with these types of modes, you're almost looking for kind of like key trigger words, kind of those like red flag things like like chest pain or like Eric's example, like I've fallen off a cliff and I can't move, you know. Um, the, but, uh, you know, I think the, the challenge is, is, is trying to get quickly through this so you don't have too many of these back and forths and really trying to tease out what their primary concern is. Because a lot of times, even through these simple modes, um, all someone really needs is like reassurance that their problem is actually probably not that serious and it's very likely to get it to go away um, with just some time and maybe a few other things. And I think, you know, in, in my work specifically in chat, it's it has, you know, required me to kind of reframe the way um, I typically do deliver because you are missing that that face-to-face -face connection with them. We do have the ability for someone to upload a photo so you can at least take a look. So that's like kind of that next layer of info. Um, and, you know, through email, there's the ability to um, upload attachments as well, which, which again, provide an additional richness to, um, to the, the interaction. But I still think that key is like trying to figure out what their true worry is first. Um, and as long as you can identify what that true question is, and even sometimes on chat, I'll actually ask that right at the stop, like, you know, not why you came on chat, but like, what is your actual like concern? Um, and, you know, a lot of people will then go, oh, I just want to know if I need to be seen today or I, I can wait. Um, and I'd say nine times out of 10, I can usually just give them advice of something to try too. So I think that's probably the, um, with this mode, it's like the, the tough, toughest thing is to, um, is to really tease out that kind of core reason um, and trying to do it in the, in the minimal amount of time. So there's not a lot of that back and forth. Thank you, Eric. I mean, Adam, sorry. I know your name. So let's move on to having the same conversation, but this is more focused on care by phone and care by video. Remembering it could be a phone call with your own physician versus or your own therapist or your own nurse or with a physician or a nurse or a therapist could be um, scheduled or it could be on demand. So the question is, have you used it? 
and when to use it that it didn't turn out to be the right choice. And we will start with Trevor. I thought Ted was going to go first. <laughs> um, so for me, with uh, with the phone specifically, I will say I love the phone visits. I find them easy. Um, and as Adam was saying earlier, you we get so much of it out of the history that we don't need to be bringing patients in. And so you're creating it. What's the easy button for the patients, right? To call, to schedule, to find a ride, to get in, to miss work. That's a lot for a sinus infection or for a little bit of, of back pain or a headache. And I, and I think what I've really loved about phone visits is being, is having it be very quick and easy. And as far as specific examples, I love phone visits for high blood pressure. So if a patient comes in, they have high blood pressure on the day of the visit, I'll have them go home and check it and have a scheduled phone visit in two weeks, see what they're doing and make adjustments. And then once they're controlled, I'll bring them back. Um, same for sugars, A1C is high, great, check your sugars, follow up in a week, adjust meds. And then once they're controlled, and then I just wait for that follow-up A1C. Um, you know, heart failure, COPD, somebody who's getting sick with a COPD exacerbation, I don't necessarily need to see them. I need to talk to them because they might need antibiotics, they might need steroids, they might need to come in, but that's a lot of stuff that can be managed on the phone. And then what we're really striving for is to prevent that worsening of their condition and going to the ED or urgent care, et cetera. Um, sinusitis, headaches, anxiety, depression. I think there's a lot that we can use phone visits for that, I, that again, I personally love. Um, as far as what doesn't work well for phone visits, I, I probably have to think about that a little bit more. It's, it's more if they have something you have to see, like if it's a rash or something where I actually need to see you for it, then that's where it doesn't quite work. But even then you can take a lot of that history. So if they do show up either on video or in your office, it's now a five minute visit because now I just got to do the exam. I see it, I've diagnosed it and then moving on. Um, and I'm going to stop you there for a second and just put a little talent to you. What about if telephone is not necessary? Um, what do you mean? So you, you did it by phone, but we didn't even need to use it to do it by phone. I love my osteoporosis example. Oh, so, go ahead. Well, that, that then because like using just text or email or what have you. Yeah, absolutely. So plenty of times have I managed, like again, talking about sugars and blood pressure, right? I can just have the patient email me their sugar readings, their blood pressure and make that adjustment. Um, osteoporosis, I'm going to start a bisphosphonate. I can send them an email and do that. Absolutely. Um, so phone, if that's what works for them. And again, it's in a, it's one of the tools in the toolbox that we can pull out and, and leverage. Um, and the other thing I really do like about phone is it does allow for other members of the family. So as an internist, take care of a lot of older people and many of their kids may live out of state or just can't get in because they're working. And the phone just lets more people join that conversation. Flipping to video, um, you know, video, I, I, I really learned, I mean, I love, I love the video visits. I find them easy. It helps us connect with people. Again, it's that face-to-face, -face, it's seeing facial expressions, how much you care. Um, and, I, and I love what Eric said earlier, just about, it's about relationship building and it's that touching of the hand or what have you. And this is where I think video visits are, are so helpful because especially if it's a new patient that doesn't know you, but is afraid to come in because of COVID or they can't get in, the video visit creates that connection of, oh, now I see you and you see me. And it helps accelerate that building of a trust that may be more difficult through email or chat or a phone because of that face-to-face -face that we get. And so um, very helpful for new, for new patients. Um, and also if you do have to do a little bit of an exam, of, like again, you're trying to look at a rash or you want them, you're assessing their rotator cuff or sciatica, you can physically watch the patient do things. You can watch them walk and do a lot of these things via video. And I think Adam alluded to this, but um, we leverage this a lot with our specialty groups where we could then connect with a neurologist and say, hey, can you watch this patient walk for me? I'm worried about X, Y, or Z. And then they could see things real time. So really, really helpful. Um, and um, and, I, and for both of these, as far as what works well and what doesn't, I really loved what Adam said, and I just want to reiterate it because I think it's so critical. It's really diving into what is the patient most worried about? And it's really focusing it from the patient. You know, as clinicians, we know there's a lot of things patient call us about, and we're like, it's no big deal. It's just chest pain. It's GERD. It's whatever. But the patient's worried. And if I tell a patient it's just GERD, don't worry about it, or their headache is just a headache, but they're thinking, yeah, but what about my brain cancer? How did you miss my brain cancer? 
it, it behooves us to really dive in deep and have a patient, have us understand what are you really worried about? Because either a, I missed it and you're right. I should worry about that too. And let me explore that. Or here's why I'm not worried about it. And here's when I would be worried about it. So if you start to develop X, Y, or Z, call me again. Um, and I think that's the the critical critical part. Um, and with all of these communications, this is where I would also just stress this: you want to be crystal clear about when the patient should call back. I know we do that a lot in our in our face to face, and sometimes it can be easier. But I think because of the technology and so much can be lost in translation at times, especially if it's email or chat, you can lose some things. Same with phone, and even same with the video. I think it's just very critical to make sure that they know this is what I'm saying today, based on what you're telling me today. If things change, progress, worsen. I need to know, or if they don't get better in a week, I need to know so that the patient knows that that they should and can call back if things accelerate. Um, yeah, and I think video, as far as what doesn't work, I think more when if they are if it's hard of hearing or it's a technology challenge. I think some people said that um, definitely at Kaiser we tried to institute video five, six years ago, and we really had a lot of low adopters and we tried so hard to get people to do it. And, you know, silver lining with the pandemic is really getting all of us more comfortable with this virtual care and realizing really it's it's easy and it works. And I think that is going to be um, one of the silver linings through all of this, because we've definitely seen a better, better bigger adoption of video visits, because I know that was one of the chat questions. Thank you, Jan. And let's see, we're going to have Eric add on to you, and I will just a couple of themes in the questions, because I think you can insert these themes into your answers in all the different topics. Um, one is, are we limiting or can we limit the number of times they can use X? They, can they limit the number of emails they can send? Can they limit the number of phone calls? I'm not saying to address that specifically, just keep it as part of your conversation. Eric, you have the floor. Wow, great, great, great question. Um, I mean, you certainly run into problems with uh, the virtual options with certain patients um, who, for lack of a better word, I'm going to say will abuse it. Um, whether that's, you know, they're going to contact you for urgent issues when, when really it says, you know, only use email for non-urgent advice. Um, and then sometimes really, I think just, uh, ongoing challenging sometimes it gets you know people are just like on the on social media you know people will um be unprofessional sometimes insulting uh you know so how to how to address that issue um i've not really seen a good set of rules that says you know you can have five emails per day or one email per week that kind of thing i think it's um I'm going to go back to my, my point before around training, where I think, you know, the, the, the training is really important around this. So we do a lot of training of our teams, um, motivational interviewing. We also do a fair amount of training with our behavioral health specialist around, you know, how to deal with difficult patients or difficult communications. And I think a lot of that is around sort of recognizing when the conversation is going in a, in a non-productive way. And that can be either, you know, how it's going interpersonally or, uh, you know, medically, is this still appropriate or not? Um, I love the idea of doing training that involves, you know, going through some cases um, and discussing as a team, uh, you know, here's a case of, of uh, what happened, whether it's a case of, you know, too much virtual communication um, and therefore delayed diagnosis, it should have been converted earlier, or um, unprofessional communication that, um, you know, went awry. Um, so I'm more of a fan of, you know, having some very basic uh, guardrails and then focusing more on training using um, case studies. But um, I'm sure there's a different perspective on that. Other people, you know, might, might prefer like, okay, you get three emails per whatever. Did I answer your question? So Eric, this is Ted. I know I haven't talked yet because I'm going to talk more about the research part of it. But um, and and for everybody, um, what we've seen in doing the analysis of this, we've seen uh, people that use one chat session per year, all the way up to 240 within a one month period. So you know the, the, what you said about training 
it's not only training the physicians and the caregivers on how to use these virtual care tools, it's also that communication and what Jen said about uh, creating that engagement and trust with the patients. Uh, and that's not an easy thing to do, but there is that training that happens as you engage patients uh, in the different venues of virtual care about training them when to use which one for which cases. So it becomes, it's not gonna happen from day one when you turn on the switch. It's gonna happen iteratively over the months and years that you are doing virtual care. I might just, just add to that too. I think, you know, we, we do a lot of planning based on fear. So we fear the, the personality disordered patient who's gonna, you know, abuse this, the system. And so I would say, you know, that's going to be the outlier. I think that you should probably, you know, base the majority of your sort of rules and limits and training around, you know, the 80, 90% of people who are going to be appropriate. Um, you know, don't kill your, your product and your, your service line based on, uh, you know, your, your fear of the occasional abuser. Um, but, you know, again, train to identifying when that's happening, when that, uh, that needs to be addressed. Let us move on for our last specific topic of telehealth processes, and that's about remote patient monitoring, very different from the other ones. And I'm going to start with Adam. So again, when have you used this for what? When has it worked well? And when has it not worked well? Yeah, that's a great question. And, you know, I think remote patient monitoring has, has, has shown so much potential promise over the last... I mean, many, many years. I mean, I, I think the, we've had kind of the, the, the capabilities have been there. Um, I mean, ever since uh, different consumer digital devices, you know, started to be able to be connected to um, some sort of web or cloud-based service, um, that integration of that data, I think, has always been wanted. I think what's the big, been the biggest challenge, and um, it goes a, a bit to kind of Eric's point of this, like, kind of, like, fear of, of kind of the outlier. But I think a lot of times clinicians have this fear that, oh man, if all my diabetic patients all of a sudden have this glucometer, I'm gonna just get this like data dump of like, you know, Excel spreadsheets of, um, of glucoses. And what's, you know, <clears throat> what I think is starting to happen, and, and I think this is gonna continue to evolve. Um, you know, right now we're in this state where we have all these potential devices that could integrate. But we need kind of that um, kind of mother system that would kind of be taking all that data, aggregating it, and then having specific rules or eventually using some sort of artificial intelligent machine learning process that, you know, where it would only be triggering for certain conditions or patterns. Um, you know, I think like on my Apple Watch, I mean, I can take, uh, um, a, you know, a single lead um, EKG now. Um, and it has the ability to export it as a PDF. I mean, one of my physician colleagues recently, he, he got off his exercise bike and he felt a little weird. And so he took it and he sent it to me. He's like, what do you think? And, um, you know, I was like, that looks like a fib, <laughs> you know? And so, I mean, I think we have all this, this data that's out there. And so I think the biggest use cases, you know, to, to the kind of the specific question, um, I think there's a lot of promise around glu glu glucometers, both for obstetrical care and I think just diabetic care in general. Um, I think blood pressure monitors also have um, a lot of promise in this because they're well connected. Um, and then uh, uh, scales as well, you know, particularly around the use case of, uh, of patients with congestive heart failure, um, being able to um, keep tabs on their blood pressure checks and more importantly, their regular weight checks, you know, um, that, that's probably the simplest use case clinically, you know, like all we care about and want to prevent is the bad exacerbation of congestive heart failure that puts them in the emergency room or the hospital or, you know, them get really sick. And if, you know, if they're measuring their weight every day and they don't notice that their weight's only going up a quarter of a pound, you know, at each day, but if the system was able to have some sort of threshold where it would get triggered to the care team, you could potentially get that person in sooner and you know, actually weigh them, check them, make sure they don't have worsening edema, and you know, prevent kind of that adverse outcome. So, 
I think that's how I would frame up the where I think remote monitoring. And I do think it's going to be the the future. I mean, eventually, I think I think our actual devices themselves. We can't see it because it's my background, but you know, our actual devices will. I think will then will be the aggregator, and they will be the thing that's going to kind of queue up um, and alert the patient, but then subsequently could could alert their care teams too. Eric, you have the floor. Yeah, I just wanted to to comment. I I, I agree with you. I think that um, you know the technology is coming uh, with the the direct interface with your you know EMR and the ability to to take some of the data, you know, set some alerts when when. Uh, scary stuff comes in and then also, uh, you know, aggregating data to tell you about, you know, diabetes control, blood pressure control, all of that uh, population health based stuff. But I just wanted to share an experience that we had with, um, you know, pulse oximeters during the, the pandemic, um, you know, when this first happened and, and most of our care was virtual. Um, so we only take care of uh, Medicare patients. So a lot of um, uh, sicker complex patients that we worried about hospitalization. And so uh, anybody who called in with cough, shortness of breath, fever, any of, any of those symptoms, um, we'd give them a pulse oximeter. And to be honest, we started, I just went down to, uh, you know, Walgreens, I bought as many pulse oximeters as I could find and we just handed them out. Um, now there's some rules around CMS, you can't give away too much free stuff. So we called it a loan and tried to get them back. Um, but why not? And, and so when we called patients, how are you doing? How are you feeling? What's your oxygen level? Do you need oxygen? Some patients, we got them oxygen at home. Um, and other patients, we knew, okay, you need to go to the hospital uh, or you need to go uh, to urgent care, something along those lines. Made a huge difference in, in determining, you know, who needed to be hospitalized or not. Um, so why not all your COPD patients, your CHF patients, you know, get a pulse oximeter, all of your CHF patients, um, get a weight scale. And some of that stuff, we don't need to wait for the technology, you know, for it to integrate, as long as you have a team member who can call them and say, you know, tell me what your weights have been over the last week. Um, use the human element to, to get the data. But I see no reason why we shouldn't be giving some of this stuff out to our patients for monitoring, um, even now. That would be a value-based care reimbursement model, I think. Well, and I think what Eric just brought up is important. I mean, a lot of this stuff, you don't have to wait for, you know, kind of the, the holy grail, like the, the, the supercomputer that's analyzing all this. I mean, like, I think the pulse oximeter is a great example um, in that, I mean, well, I think for a while during the COVID pandemic, you couldn't find one anywhere, even um, on any website, but, uh, but they are, I mean, they're so inexpensive. And yeah, I mean, are they, are they, as precise and accurate as like a, a health grade specific one, maybe not, but they're, they're still quite accurate. I know there was a question about that too, like how do you deal with all these different remote monitoring devices and the accuracy and and that sort of thing. And, you know, it's just, again, I think the, the products themselves are, are continuing to get better and better and more precise, you know, specifically digital scales. I mean, digital scales will measure the half pound um, at least. So. My, my example of kind of the heart failure patient is as long as they're still doing this on a regular basis, you know, it may not pick up the day-to-day -day change, but eventually it's going to pick up that half pound change and then the full pound change. Um, so I think that's another kind of key point around this too. So I'd like to move on to have Dr. Ted Pauline share his expertise with us. I'll remind you that he's a senior investigator with the Institute for Health Research of Kaiser Permanente, Colorado a long-term internal medicine physician and expert and researcher. He's just gonna share the demographics he's learned over the last year and before that in the use of virtual care and how they use it. Um, Ted, you have the floor. Thank you, I uh, appreciate the chance to discuss some of these things. Uh, I've been an uh, informatics researcher for 20 plus years and the things we've learned on how, how to use uh, what I call virtual care tools is, is so important uh, when we look at the research of uh, then how do you implement. I think back to the, uh, the paper I did uh, back in 2012 that was published in JAMA, where it was showing that people that had access to email, and of course email was fairly new at that point, being able to e email your physician and caregivers, that people that used email used more of all other services. And that 
increase in utilization of all other services did not come back to baseline for 18 months after their initial use of email. Uh, so is that a is that an indicator of how a virtual care will will flow? So we did a, actually a pragmatic study. The COVID the COVID allowed us to kind of do a pre and post evaluation of some virtual care modalities uh, pre COVID, and then of course when COVID hit, as you know, a lot of people moved to remote care. And in Kaiser specifically, within a week time, we went from 12% virtual care encounters to 70 to 90% of all our encounters were uh, virtual care, uh, depending on the, the department. So in our learnings in how we analyze this is first, both pre-COVID and during COVID, most virtual care users are females over 60% of virtual care users are female. And this was surprising to us a little bit. Uh, the next one was in the pre-COVID period, uh, most virtual care users were under the age of 50. That, that we kind of assume, you know, the digital technology stuff, we think younger people would take advantage of that. In the during COVID period, actually more of the virtual care users were over the age of 50. So it kind of went against some hypotheses that the older people would not uh, take up virtual care digital options for care. But actually we saw a doubling of the use of virtual care among our members that were over the age of 70. So their use of virtual care doubled during the COVID period. Now, some of that was maybe due to the fact they couldn't get in and they had to use some means to talk about their medical issues, but it also shows that they're willing to use digital tools. The other thing that kind of surprised us was that, um, that during pre-COVID, actual users were probably in the little bit lower income category. Um, but during the COVID, actually, the, the lower income, family median income users uh, actually decreased more. And actually, the people making $50,000 a year, actually it was $86,000 a year, now that I look at my numbers again, um, $86,000 a year or more increased their use of uh, virtual care tools. So the, the high income families are actually taking advantage of this. We thought the, the members that were in high deductible plans where uh, you didn't have to have a copay to use virtual care would use it more and actually their utilization of it decreased. And so we, you know, we wonder, is that due to a digital divide issue going on? not being comfortable with it. Um, so that needs some more evaluation of what that really means. Um, the, uh, the other interesting thing about this is that um, like our email study back that was published in JAMA in 2012, people that used, this is pre-COVID I'm gonna talk about. So the year before COVID hit, people that used virtual care also used more of all other services. During COVID, at not to be surprised, pe more people started using virtual care. Those that were virtual care users prior to COVID increased their use of virtual care. Office visits plummeted, but we know why that happened. They were closed. But even office visits stayed low even when we started opening up in July. So we were, we're looking at delving into, well, why are more services being used by these virtual care people? And prior to COVID, virtual care was thought of as maybe being a substitute for the need for in-person care. What we are seeing during this COVID phenomenon, and will this 
keep on going post COVID? We don't know. But what, what we're seeing is virtual care tools aren't just a substitute for in-person care. They become an adjunct to care in general. So as, as the other physicians were talking about their experience in using virtual care for care delivery, what we're seeing is that it becomes a triage tool. Instead of the patient saying, well, I just got to go to the ER for this. Well, no, your symptoms are such you don't have to go to the ER. Uh, we can schedule you an appointment tomorrow to be seen in person. Uh, the other thing is that it can be a management tool, just like Adam was talking about for hypertension and diabetes. And that's what we've seen with asthma care. And this will be my last point, John, Jan. Um, what we've delved in on asthma care is the asthmatics increase their use of virtual care dramatically, increase their compliance with their um, maintenance inhalers, and dramatically decrease their need for urgent and emergency care because of asthma exacerbations. So we're interpreting that as this becomes a tool to manage patients. Thank you, Ted, Dr. Ted. Um, so just looking at the questions, because we have about eight minutes left. Um, one of the questions is about training. There's a lot of conversation about training, and I can't say enough about the Southwest Telehealth Research Center. My last few slides, I'm going to show you how to get to their site, and they do an inordinate amount of trainings, and I highly recommend them. Um, it's government-sponsored, we should be using them. So I will show you that among the last slides. Another question, now this is a question for the docs, is what happens when you have tech challenges? Either your end or the patient end, what do you do? How often does that happen? How do you prevent it? I mean, I can tell you when I, when I implemented video visits with KP Colorado, we required every single patient to do a practice visit with national IT before they had could do it with a doctor. But that got so overwhelming and so we stopped. I will hand it over to the docs now. Yeah, Jan, I can dovetail onto that because Upsoft has been, you know, clearly discussed, you know, during COVID, things exploded extremely fast. And it not only pushed um, the comfort level, I think, of care providers and teams, it also pushed that kind of comfort zone with, with patients too. Um, and then coupled with, you know, potentially some new technological platforms um, getting kind of fast-tracked, you know, that typically would have taken three to six months to like bring to kind of like a pilot and deployment stage, all of those things got accelerated extremely fast too. So, you know, I think the, you know, I think, but, you know, I think to Ted's point is, you know, I think it's a little bit of a, of a fear that like, you know, that a, a, a lot of patients are gonna have trouble with this. And I'm not trying to belabor the, or belittle the point that there wasn't a lot of technological issues, both on the provider side and on the, the patient side. Um, especially when things were just flourishing, you know, literally a year ago from, from this month. Um, but I think the, you know, the thing with it is, is it's one of those things that like, it's uncomfortable in any new situation. And so even if there are some of those technical challenges initially, like the next time the provider does it or the next time the patient does it, it's a better experience for them individually. And if it's with the same provider, it's usually just a better experience. So, um, but yeah, I mean, having, you know, online tools, you know, like we have with Zoom meetings where, you know, it takes you through and, you know, checks your microphones working, your camera's working, you know, those types of things have been put into platforms for patients. Um, and yeah, having the ability to, if your organization can support it, um, to have like that kind of check, tech check. Um, in KP Colorado, we still offer that um, for, pe for, for patients. They can, they can sign up and they have a, a kind of a fake booked appointment and, and they go through the whole process. So that's usually the best way. So can I add on to that too? Uh, one of the things is I think organizations that have multiple platforms available can then use those that if what if the video visit isn't working well, you switch it just seamlessly over to a, a, a texting uh, or the phone call so that you can seamlessly switch from one platform to another if one is causing a problem. And I think that has been a tremendous uh, opportunity for both the patients and the providers within Kaiser, because we have so many platforms, they're able to switch from one to the other. 
The other thing I would add to that that, that we used as a backstop at, at Iora, which I thought was really clever, um, is uh, we would we would actually send a notebook or a, a, what am I trying to say tablets uh, preloaded with uh, the software with only one option: you turn it on and uh, you go to your video visit. And so we would FedEx it uh, to the house, um, do the video visit. So this is for people who couldn't figure out how to you know, do a Zoom video or even, you know, some people don't even know how to, you know, click on a link to a website and that worked well. And then the other thing too is um, engage families, uh, you know, get, get families to come together with your patients. And for us, all our patients, almost all of our patients are over 65, older, relatively low income, complicated patients. And we got, you know, 80% of them doing their care uh, by video, which was remarkable. You know what? Go ahead, Jen. The only thing I was going to stress, I'm sure if people are hearing this, it seems like, oh, but you're this big company, and so you guys have all these tools. Yeah, and I know I was not, Eric. Um, and I think, remember the title of this. This was as if we could do just the right care for the patient, and that's really what value-based care is. It's the right care for the patient where money is, the money doesn't matter because it's it's paying for the right care for the patient. So we're not forced to bring that patient in. We're not forced to to kind of this churn where we can do a phone visit because it's appropriate or an email visit is appropriate. And in the end, it's cheaper on the healthcare system, better care for the patient in many ways. And then we're leveraging the office visits for that. And so I'm sure as people are hearing this, it sounds like whatever, at least for some people. And I think just kind of a reminder, this is assuming if it wasn't fee for service and it really was value-based care, true value-based care, these are the tools that can really that can really help move. And I think, again, the, the people that are on here today are really talking about, this is what we have lived for, for most of our careers. And um, I would say, I think I speak for all of us, it's, it's, um, it's a very fulfilling way to practice if you can land in that spot, because then you do get to just take care of patients um, in the way that's right for patients, no more, no less. Other comments? This is Ted again, and I'm actually working with the organization or a University of Toronto researchers. Somebody asked the question in the chat about how do you get the iPads back? Actually, in this project, it, there it's a it's a iPhone or an Android that's specifically geared for elderly. That similar to what Eric was saying, uh, it's 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 quote quote unquote dumbed down. So it's just big buttons and guides the. Um, the members, the patients through the thing without having all, all the other apps and everything on it. So these are actually given to the patients permanently. So I'm gonna wrap it up and anybody who wants to stay on longer, you are welcome to stay on longer. Either, I don't know if the docs will stay on longer or not, but if anybody wants to stay on and we can chat away, um, check this website again, SWTRC and the American, Ameri Arizona Medicine Program do extraordinary training. Check out this website. And finally, page down. Um, obviously, we always want your feedback, how we can make this better. And I assume that Chris, you'll put that in the chat, the link. Please, please, please provide feedback to us on how we could have done better today. Thank you, everybody.